Hello and welcome back to Spy Hard's podcast. I'm Agent Scott. And I'm Cam the Provocateur. And we're here with another Spy Master interview. And this time, we're going festive. Damn right we are, with one of the all-time great Christmas spy films. Although there's not a lot of competition, but it doesn't matter because this one would still be reigning near the top. We were thrilled to have the opportunity to speak to Yvonne Zimmer, who of course played Caitlin, the daughter of Gina Davis's character Samantha Kane in the only other spy Christmas film, The Long Kiss Goodnight. Yeah, a movie we tackled about a year ago and had a lot of fun talking about it. Didn't quite make the knock list, but for reasons that really didn't have anything to do with what makes it so fun. Like, it is still a total blast to watch. It's just one of those, I don't want to say easy watch films. Like, it, it's it's not particularly complex, but it's just a fun romp. And, you know, we're somewhat lacking when it comes to uh, festive spy films, or what I will now call festbionage. <laughs> and I actually, you know, rewatched the movie for this interview. And I am not going to lie. I had some knockless regrets while I was watching it because I had a ton of fun watching it to the point where I was like, why is there no 4K transfer of this movie? Like, I would totally buy this movie. Yeah, it's insane. But let's get to the interview proper. We can talk about it afterwards. Cam, hit it. And joining us now on the podcast, it is, of course, Yvonne Zimmer. Hello, how are you? I'm so good. Thank you for having me. Big fan of spy movies. <laughs> good, good. It's all we ever talk about, so it's nice to have someone else to talk to about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I never, I never do interviews, so I'm like, well, you're, you're. This is a noble cause. <laughs> Thank you. No, it, I have to say, just as, as a preface, like it, we were very thankful and shocked that you, you said yes to this because it's a, it's a film we both really enjoy, and it's really nice to talk to someone who's, well, pivotal to the film. Um, which we'll, we'll we'll get to the film itself in a minute, but you know, with our interviews with people, we like to sort of get to know them a bit more. So before the long kiss, good night, acting as a whole, how did you get into acting? What made you want to get into it in the first place? It's um, I come from a very uh, actory kind of family, and I used to attend live tapings of the the nanny. And my mm-hmm. sister was one of the youngest kids on that show, and in my mind, through mimicry, I thought oh, well, she's getting older, I should probably take over. And I told my mom, I was like, she's getting on in years. Uh, maybe if they need a younger <laughs> character. I'll tag I, in. Yeah, yeah. I thought, um, I thought like, it's that age where you you don't realize you age, you don't, like there's object impermanence and all this, all this psychological stuff. And I was like, well, she should stay the same age. So every year there should be a new person playing the same character. <laughs> Uh, so then I got an agent because I obviously wanted to do it too. And do you remember like, you know, your first roles, like how did they help shape, you know, kind of as you joined the industry? Yeah. Um, my first role was uh, a hostage girl in the movie Heat in Michael Mann's uh, police procedural thriller bank bank heist movie, not to spoil it for everyone, but um and I had to audition for Al Pacino, but that was the extent of that audition was like coloring in a coloring book and talking because I was five. So the auditions are a little different when you're a kid. They're just like, uh, okay, she can kind of talk and she's not crying. So <laughs> we'll hire her. Now, when you were actually shooting your scene for Heat, what was it like, you know, at a young age working with Michael Mann? We'll talk about Rennie Harlan going forward and some of the other directors, but uh, Michael Mann is known to be very exacting. I'm just very curious how he's working with a child actor. Well, I don't remember him too much. I, I mostly remember Al and he was a method actor. So I thought it was very odd. He stayed in character after the scene and they called cut and he was like, are you all right? You okay? You okay? And I was like, uh, I'm going to just get a bagel. Like, excuse me, <laughs> sir. <laughs> like I, I was never into the method at that age. Um, so I just thought that was silly um, and continue to think so. Like whenever someone can't turn it on and off, I'm like, well, okay, I'm, I'm going to go over here and have a fruit roll up, you know? Um, but yeah, I remember that shootout. So I was the hostage girl in Tom Sizemore's arms when he is shot in the head, which is a very dangerous stunt. And um, I remember that shootout very well. Uh, it was downtown LA and I, I collected all the Uzi bullet shells as like mementos. 
because I thought that I really thought it was so cool. Um, and now I've, I, I changed my mind about guns a lot. Mm. But when I was five, I was like, neat, semi-automatic weapons. Oh, my God. And what was the collaboration like with Tom Sizemore there? Because it's a fairly, you know, intense scene of him grabbing you and running with you with a gun and obviously a lot of ammunition going off around you. That's got to be quite um, intense for a, you know, very small child. Yeah, it, it, it was, you know, for me, I grew up doing action movies, so uh, I just thought it was all fun. And, um, and it, actually nowadays I'm a little, I am a little deaf from all the gun gunfire I've been around collectively as a kid. Cause I didn't, I would take my earplugs out and I was really interested in the bombs going off. And I, I just thought it was like Disneyland. So it's a very odd upbringing, but um, Tom Sizemore was amazing to work with and really sweet. And everyone would always ask afterwards, like, are you okay? Cause this is, it was a crazy scene. And um, just in terms of gun safety, our, the, the gun was not at a quarter charge. It was full charge, uh, which Michael Mann insisted on. And that's pretty, uh, in retrospect, that's pretty dangerous to do mm. nowadays. They shouldn't do that. So, mm. but this was the crazy nineties. Our budgets were huge and, you know, um, sets were, sets were a little more wild back then. Right. Well, I think we'll probably touch on, um, being around explosions and things like that, maybe when we get to the film, just a little bit. Uh, but you, you said something a minute ago, I maybe wanted to jump back on, because you, know, you are, you said five when you auditioned for Heat. That's, uh, and you're doing, I mean, they, they said, you said the audition was a coloring, uh, coloring book, but yeah, you know, what was that process like as a five-year-old having to audition? Even if it was a coloring book, that's still a, a lot of pressure on, on a five-year-old. Um, for me, I never felt uh, pressure. I always thought it was, I continue to think the same way about acting that it's um, there's two categories of actors, like those that take themselves seriously and those who don't. And within that, there's those who are talented and those who aren't. And I always felt like, you know, not taking it very seriously. So to me, it was always play. And a lot of actors at that age are amazing because they're still in touch with being a kid. So mm -hmm. for me, it was always just like, oh, cool. I just get to play. I, uh, the stakes were not high. And I think that's why I, I worked a lot when I first started, because I was coming in like, uh, who cares? <laughs> like bossing people around and saying funny things and just kind of, um, you know, being myself as a kid. So because uh, that same year I so that same year I got on a show called ER as a kid and was on that for seven years and did a bunch of action movies. There's another one, Executive Decision, mm -hmm. and then of course, leading up to what we'll talk about. But um, yeah, I just thought it was all silly. I still do. And people are lucky if they work in this industry. So hmm. it, it can certainly be silly from what we've we've learned over the years now from watching yeah. these films. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I had a question just about executive decision. Um, now, were you one of the kids on the plane, right? Yeah. So again, um, we're going to explore some typecasting. I was a hostage in that. <laughs> like, right. never know. I, was, I was a hostage, like a tearful, endangered way um, in the 90s in many action movies. Um, yeah. And I got to work with Halle Berry, who uh, I had a crush on as a child. I was like, this is as beautiful as a woman and as nice as a woman could ever be. Like very formative of uh, just like the idea of what kindness can be on a set is someone like a Halle Berry. I think that was one of her first roles. And how long did you shoot on that film? So, cause I'm in the background so often, I, I don't know if I have a part really. I, I haven't seen it a long time. Um, I was there maybe three or four weeks cause it's, it, mm -hmm. it's all one plane. It just takes place in a plane. So stuck there the whole time, but just sitting <laughs> right. and going, yeah. But at that point, it's all just fun and games, I imagine. Well, the, the, you're on a film set. It's just cool. Yeah. And, and it's why I still love action movies. It's why, like, I if, if, any, if, if Terminator 2 is on, I need to watch it. Like, I'm like, this is one of the best movies of all time. <laughs> uh, you know, or Die Hard or, you know, some of the movies I've been in. I'm like, I really love The Longest Goodnight. I think it's really underrated and very funny. I think that, that pivots us over completely because that's we certainly agree with that opinion. Um, we mm -hmm. actually spoke about this film last year. It was our first ever Christmas film we ever talked about. So um, my first question is, how did you 
you know go about getting the role were you approached did you audition for it how did that process start yeah I auditioned uh many times and then the final audition was with Gina Davis and there's a scene where I'm kind of rousing her back to life um Mm -hmm. and uh it was that scene and you just have to cry and that character was swearing and I was like cool I get to swear (laughs) fuck yeah I was just so jazzed um and uh there's another actress who I was in awe of named Mara Wilson who is in the audition uh waiting room and I just I've always been a fan of her. So I was like, oh man, I hope she gets it. Cause I did not understand the concept of like, if she gets it, I don't like, again, not very competitive, just kind of uh, very, very Zen about this, this business and um, sort of just excited to try it out or be in a character. Um, but I, I, I definitely did a great job. I still have the audition tape, which is pretty, it's pretty like intense because it's a death scene of my mother. Um, and afterwards they were like, how did you do that? Oh my God. And I'm like, a uh, fire in the belly. I don't know. So like a very weird child, child acting, you know, method of no method. Like, just like, you just do it. I, you know, where are the snacks? <laughs> <laughs> And how are they describing the project to you when you're going to audition? Um, they don't. I read the script. So I really loved reading. And mm-hmm. um, and the script was way different than the film is. It, uh, it originally was a big flashback. It opens with the mother covered in blood and her daughter thinks she had a nightmare and is talking about this. Uh, the, I don't want to spoil things, so, but this certain like action sequence. So the daughter's referring to that and the, and the mother's like, Oh, it's okay, sweetie. That was a dream, but it wasn't. We flash back to the whole, uh, what movie you, you see, um, now. So, um, read the script. I, even at that young age, really good writing sticks out. It was really well-written. That script uh, definitely deserved its big payday. I'm a huge fan of Shane Black and have since become pretty uh, close friends with him over the years so I just yeah there's no they don't really describe it to you You just read the script go in the audition and um try to you know befriend everyone so you know you've you've read the script at this point and you've you've gone to the audition compared to what you obviously shot in the end did the the character evolve at any point that that you've been playing or yeah your character no, 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 no. Uh, like kids in, in movies are just there to be cute or they're, they're there for a plot de- device. So like in all the Shane Black movies, there's the child endangerment mm-hmm. uh, plot line. And it's like, it's a great MacGuffin for the film or a, a great time clock if there's a bomb, you know, it's just a wonderful device to get us to the next location or destination. So I'm, I was that, <laughs> I was that uh, entity, I think. Now, I'm really curious about working with Gina Davis and just, you know, being a child actor. I'm always interested about the relationship between the child actor and then the adult actor working opposite them. And I was just really curious about establishing the chemistry and sort of building sort of a bonding relationship on screen. Yeah, she was a really generous and wonderful um, role model and mentor. And also when I was that age, she was like this Amazonian figure. Uh, just like so towering over me and at the time also very ripped she got really like uh, pumped up for that role so I was just like wow cool like just so in awe and um, we did get very close on that set because she hadn't had kids yet and she wrote me a lovely card that was like if I had a daughter I'd love her to be just like you so I felt very um, lucky to be in her hands and also she's quite a genius she's in Mensa she was an archer I just thought, wow, another person like like a Halle Berry, where I just encounter all these examples of really uh, extraordinary people. Like actors, actors get such a bad rap for the couple that drive into Seven Elevens or uh, party from exhaustion. Like some actors are just in touch with what life's about, like like experiencing it fully, living fully, and being as kind as possible to everyone and shining a bright light. And Gina Davis was, was very much that. And also I was at an age where I didn't brush my teeth very often. And she's like, you got to brush your teeth, kid. And I was like, okay, yeah. Because I didn't like the taste of toothpaste. So um, definitely she changed my life there. It would have been a totally different path. 
<laughs> yeah. It's, it's worth some sage wisdom from Gina Davis there. Brush your teeth, folks. That's uh, it, <laughs> it's not wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, well, you mentioned um, Gina Davis's sort of physicality in the film. You know, she she did get in great shape for it. And a question I had because obviously you're doing quite physical stuff in this film too. I mean, the character's thrown out of the house potentially. If that was you, I don't know. We'll get to that maybe. But there's you're doing a lot of stuff. Did you do any physical training for it, or was it more just, "Hey, Yvonne, can you jump out this window, please?" You know. So no, I I probably metabolically was maybe even at a certain age later than I was six when I did the film. So kids are pretty elastic, but I was a big donut eater, cereal eater. And I don't think I knew what a vegetable was at that age. <laughs> so I was like the opposite of in shape, but we, I would do all my own stunts. And then my wonderful stunt double, Laura Dash um, would, you know, also do them. And then they cut together at us, you know, her doing the more dangerous um, things, but I, I really did want to do all my own stunts. And so I was in the harness and then later regretted it because harnesses are so like, I got the nickname hunchy on the set. Cause I would, they, they just crunch you down and you're like, Oh, what the heck is this? Um, and as I got older in doing other movies that might've had smaller budgets, I, I was like, no, nah, I'm, I'm good on doing my own stunts. <laughs> I learned my lesson. Um, but Laura Dash and I worked on many, uh, she worked on a couple films uh, with me and she was the amazing uh, double of the nineties for any, any child actor. So, cause she was a certain height and I think she might be 410 or something, but just, she was always there and really the loveliest, sweetest person. Now she does animal rescue. So, oh, okay. Yeah. Of the um, action sequences you worked on in the film, which was, you, you're saying, you know, you did so many of the stunts or, you know, it contributed to the stunt work. Which was the most difficult or the most technically tough to pull off? Probably getting thrown out the window because we had to do that so many times. Because um, I think when I land, it's a tumble roll. And probably that ends up being Laura or something because I, I wasn't able to get it right. But me flying out the window and my legs going, <laughs> it's, it's almost <laughs> comical, actually. Um, when I've seen it, I'm like, oh, wow, I do look silly. That might be me, but you can't ever tell like with a really excellent stunt doubles and just as a shout out to all stunt people they really make actors look like they're agile and it's just them so they're amazing um at their jobs we've uh, we've had a couple of uh, stunt people on the show so far and yeah they they uh, they elevate the film people don't realize it but they really do elevate the films that they're in and now if we're talking about the um the physicality is one side of the film but also this film's quite adult in its nature, especially in certain places. And you're part of some of those scenes. Like you mentioned when you're um, trying to wake your mother up, Gina Davis's character, you're, you're more or less you know, saying, a, what was the line? Life is pain, get used to it, back to her to try and wake her up. And this is some dark stuff. Whereas this film starts off kind of like comedy. You know, you got the, the moose coming through the windscreen and then you getting chucked out the side of a house. And by the end, like it's blood everywhere, people getting shot. Did they do anything to sort of, protect that from you or did, was it just it's the 90s just go for it no I don't at that age I didn't think I really needed protection I had two older sisters and we kind of grew up a little more on the wild side like we definitely snuck uh, a film called showgirls when we were that <laughs> age and I was like mm -hmm. six <laughs> so what well, you know reading these scripts or doing these scenes is like nothing compared to the trouble we were trying to get in and they're a little bit older. So we, um, yeah, like the only protection I needed was from my older sisters at home because they were really, they were really funny. They're like, here, like try the cigarette, you know, like, <laughs> you know, that kind of, we grew up like that. We were running around as kids, like just uh, left, left to do whatever when we were very young. So um, sets were actually more structured and more like, oh, okay, there are rules here. Like I'm going to learn to be punctual and not swear as much. Try not to. That was a big problem I had as a kid. Um, and the only glaring thing I can think of in terms of being a child actor was when I was in public school, I thought I could say fuck every other word because everyone did on set. So my mm -hmm. teachers were like, Yvonne has a real swearing problem. And we fixed that. But I was like, this is fucking stupid. You know, like, <laughs> and they were like, yeah, but, you know, for the other kids, let's let's try to blend just this just this once 
Well, how important was it having, you know, your two sisters working in the industry and then yourself entering? Did it make it a lot easier to stay grounded and basically accept the reality of working on these sets versus like a kid who didn't have that sort of, you know, exposure, maybe really overwhelmed? Yeah, everyone always wonders. So I have two sisters. We've all been in this industry. We all grew up doing it. Um, My middle sister, Vanessa Zima, was on a show called Murder One and was in a lot of indie movies, including a beautiful film um, directed by Victor Nunez uh, with Peter Fonda called Yuli's Gold, which I think is more like a Florida noir, not not spy, but definitely uh, spy adjacent. I think noir is like a distant cousin. Um, And then Madeline was on the show The Nanny, and we all grew up like on sets together, but we definitely keep each other humble. And then relatively all of us have been pretty unscathed and everyone always asks why. And I think it's because we um, were very parental with each other growing up and definitely like really kind of goody goodies. Like we also lived North of LA and not in LA. So growing up as teenagers, we'd always have to drive home. So we could never get into too much trouble. We'd be like, Oh, we got a long drive. We live in the suburbs. Like, you know, um, and I think those factors really helped helped us not turn out like like honestly so many child actors get really messed up but also they I think when they're younger they achieve a higher level of success than we did so so that they're like they feel like they're they peak or there's a fall or something and um and I always viewed it like I was more mercenary I was like cool I have a college fund like awesome like I was very detached from the result of it or feeling any which way about um, like my, my identity is not tied to being an actor so much. And did it have any impact just on going to school and having friends and knowing you're working on these big productions? Yes. So when I was, um, 12, I, uh, I went to this private school where my teacher, for whatever reason, really was into the idea. I was an actor. She's like, make a documentary, show the kids. So I filmed a documentary behind the scenes of the long kiss good night and asked everyone questions and interviewed people. And we made my class watch it. And I felt like that was kind of weird. Like I definitely got way too much attention from that um, teacher and she would let me teach the kids sometimes. And I was kind of given like maybe too much responsibility (laughs) over my peers. And it got to the point where she let me take over the holiday program and we would just spend days like putting up my plays that I would write. I wrote like very pretentious plays on the bubonic plague and Joan of Arc, except Joan of Arc was like a schizophrenic doubting that the voice she was hearing was actually God's and, and very pretentious Rushmore shit. And uh, the teacher was like, yeah, go at it. And I think that had to do with me having been in films, like special privileges. And I really, I benefited, like I, I thrived. And, and now like at, at this age, I'm a TV writer. So I definitely felt like that was the early beginnings of being a showrunner or like just running, running shit, which uh, I, I recognize was very weird and not normal for, mm-hmm. for most people. Um, but yeah. It's, it's interesting because, you know, you're saying about going to the school and this teacher giving you all this responsibility and this, uh, what I find interesting about that is them allowing you to do it. I mean, how old were you when you were doing that? Was that still around the same time? Or was this later on? I was about 12 and it was a private school they predate like charter schools, but this particular mm. private school I felt had a, a bit of a loosey goosey vibe or anything goes, which I was so used to. I was on sets. And um, I think sometimes when you grow up fast, then people give you more responsibility. Like anywhere I go, for whatever reason, I become like the first responder or um, the parent or the mother, or, you know, to the person who needs water, like drink water, you know. Um, and I think that's just from growing up quite a fast and people are like, well, if you can do this for me, sure. Like here's uh, extra responsibility. <laughs> I'm like, Oh God. You sound like the, uh, the responsible one at the party, basically the, the designated driver of us all. Yes. And on sets, I've always been like really, really concerned with safety, really. Um, and very outspoken about that later in life, like, uh, all kinds of things that have the people would try to do and I'm like no that's completely unsafe I will walk like I'm not I'm not a part of this and that usually works if people can use their bargaining power to prevent death Mm because I so I grew up um 
on the set of Heat, that that uh, teacher told a story about Vic Morrow and the Twilight Zone movie and that whole experience. And I grew up hearing these stories about how irresponsible, preventable accidents happen. And I was horrified by that and other things I've just seen. And so that's why like stunt people are so important. They're like the heroes of any action or spy movie. They make the movie. So, you know, everyone is safe. Mm -hmm. Well, um, segging back to The Long Kiss Goodnight, I want to talk about just working with Rennie Harlan, who at that point was really on a hot streak. You had, you know, Cliffhanger and Cutthroat hadn't performed necessarily very well for him, you know, the year before, but like was a very big spectacle. Like he was a guy who had a lot of power at this point in time. And I'm just really curious about working with him on a major production here and one obviously written by Shane Black. So it has a lot going for it. Yeah, he was really wonderful and very good with me as a director. Um, and really, uh, I think he really, you know, normally th that my character probably would be cut out more, but I think he really liked the, that plot line and the, the mother daughter thing. And then, of course, he and Gina were together at the time. So, you know, it was just um, I think there was a lot of love on his end, wanting to make make her a star in this in this new way. You know, I don't think she'd done an action movie before was, was I don't know if Cutthroat was before this. It was, but yeah. It was. Okay. But like really this this labor of love. And and then I was kind of caboosed into that that feeling. So um he's really he's really funny and fun to work with. And also um just the filming of this took place in one of the coldest years on record ever in Toronto. And so he like his beard was frozen, like there were surrealist things that just don't make sense. His eyelashes were frozen, like and he was never compl like never complaining, just always a consummate professional. Um, it was a really wonderful shoot and it did take about six months. So I was, that's a very long time for a kid to be mm -hmm. in one uh, production. I like, I, I began as a, a child and I was like at the end of it wearing a mink coat and chain smoking and like, oh, uh, fuck life. No, but <laughs> I was just, I went from being a kid to like a full grown adult on this, on this particular shoot. You basically so. went from being Samantha to being Charlie. Yeah, I totally had my Charlie Baltimore. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm not in the PTA anymore. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. Now, this movie has like a very specific vibe. A lot of it would seem I would almost feel like insane to watch it play, be playing out or to be performing in some of these scenes. Whereas when you watch it actually on you know the screen, it feels very cohesive in terms of what they're doing. Were there a lot of moments like that where they're trying to explain scenes to you and it would seem very strange, like not the way you would necessarily want to play it? No, a lot of times, like there's a scene with Craig Bierko, who I love and is one of the funniest people alive. If you ever get to interview him, you should. Um, where he like tries to look at my eyes to see if they're the same as um, the mother. Uh, and I'm just trying not to laugh because I had never been that near a person who's not my family. So I'm like, just don't laugh. Just don't laugh. You know, like, and I don't know if you can tell on screen, but it's like, that's some of the stuff that's going through a kid's head. Like, don't make a face. Like, <laughs> just, just get through this to the next bagel. Um, and <laughs> um, yeah, never, you know, like, I think one of the things that was crazy is when there's someone that's set on fire in a stunt and so seeing that as a kid was crazy because you don't know it's flame retardant the suit and you don't know that it's safe so and then the the scene where she grabs the gun off the body and is uh catapulted into the air by christmas lights because it's a holiday film um that was really fun to watch just like you can't pay i mean you can't you can't go see Cirque du Soleil and as a kid, you know, and have a good time, like watching some of the stuff that we just shot. It was, it was uh, over the top. The explosions were, I think Rennie would always say on set, more is more, which is just a funny, that's a very funny, he was always like that with his, with his films. Like they are really not subtle mm -hmm. uh, with the action stuff. So that was fun. I've always compared this to like um, kind of Die Hard in its own way. It, it has yeah. that vibe about it. They're just unapologetic 
action and and i think that's a good thing and and the question i wanted to to go to was sort of about gina and, and the relationship with yourself the, the mother daughter thing and you you mentioned earlier about the fact that another director this might have ended up half on the cutting room floor and you would have seen half of your character what i love about this film is it has that maternal connection and it has a strong female lead and a strong a, a, well a daughter character a child actor and that maternal instinct and that maternal connection is there the whole way through and it's not shied away from it's actually played into and i i love that about the film now i know maybe at the time you were more worried about bagels but <laughs> i mean i i love bagels now so <laughs> hey it's, it's still a thing for me but looking back on it now is that something you're you're proud of how they've managed to have that in the 90s whereas people still struggle to do that in films now yeah i think the film really works because it taps into a deeper psychological element of her character if you and if you view this character as a borderline personality um she's someone who's unpredictable so that's both thrilling and terrifying and it really taps into some of the like the the character of Charlie Baltimore Samantha Kane and that switch is what i think could be most feared in a mother and um that's like uh, underneath all the jokes and all the fun like frivolity and the the candy like action sequences you have a real character arc that works and is ultimately terrifying so um was i aware of that as, at that age no but like looking back that certain films like they really work because of that like night night moves really works because gene hackman is trying to repair his marriage and he's been cuckolded by his wife and so he escapes to the keys and gets a little bit of confidence cracking this case to get back with his wife that's what that's what we're always going towards and even in all the action movies that work they have an element of family or at least relationship with die hard like we love that that's a perfect film i love die hard so much like can i'm going to like get off here and watch it right now um but uh after we're done but yeah so that's i think uh a testament to why you can watch it and laugh and then you're like i really i like that movie and you're like why do i like that movie it's like cuz the woman she's a scary woman which so many men fear right <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh. It, it happens it, it it's it's probably i mean you talk about the response to this film i wasn't going to get to this yet but and and cam alluded to it earlier it didn't do as well as frankly it should have and i i wonder i think when we reviewed it last year i i posited an idea that if this had come out now i think it would have been a very different response to the film I mean yeah like a uh, Jason Bourne did incredibly well but you know it's it's headed by a man um I mean is it is it not a little misogynistic I mean it later not, like Tomb Raider did really well but then mm -hmm. you have video game gamer guys who are like oh cool she's hot I'll see that like it's very much um it's very hard to pull off the female action hero and have it be a, box office smash. Yeah, even a movie like Atomic Blonde which did a fantastic job with it didn't do John Wick money for example. Yeah, so it's just good old fashioned. <laughs> Especially if the woman has two personalities, oh that's I don't know if a lot of people can handle that. <laughs> right. Now, you got to actually observe those two personalities up close and act opposite them. What was it like just the dynamic it, it, from your own performance? going up against both versions of Gina Davis in this movie. Um, you know, I I really remember thinking that she was having a lot more fun playing Charlie Baltimore and so it was a lot uh, whenever an actor is 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 um is enraptured with with the good time that their character is generating. It those are fumes that you get high on. Like it it was just intoxicating to be around that character and the Samantha Kane character too was fun but you know it's like I I prefer the fun mommy who has the bottle blonde hair and is ready to kick some ass so those scenes were more engaging for me and you know the second they yell cut um you know how does Gina Davis seg from being like the you know hard edge Charlie Baltimore kind of barking at you to being Gina Davis the person like is there sort of a okay the scene's over i'm going to try to you know talk to you person to person before we get ready to do the next take on it or whatever 
Yeah, I think, you know, like that big crying scene, I think afterwards she just was like checking in, are you you okay? Like, oh, it's all right. And um, very much a human being and uh, a great example of just, again, how to be, how to walk in the world, how to make sure everyone's okay and everyone feels good because you never know. And it's, it's really nice to check in with, especially like kid actors. They you never know what circumstances brought them into that field. You, so I, uh, I've always taken that with me on other sets um, with other child actors, just like, hey, you all right, you all right, kid? Like, they're like, yeah, if I, um, it was acting. Um, yeah. Um, we've been talking for a little bit about this film and we've really neglected to mention the Samuel L. Jackson of it all. Because yeah. <laughs> by, by God, is he awesome in this film? And he's gone on record and saying if there was a, a second one, he would be the first person to sign up for it, which uh, I'm here for. And I hope everyone else is here for. I want to see, I personally would like to see your turn now. But uh, you, know, you, you are the daughter now grown up. You could also be a spy. You never know. But um, how is it working with Samuel? It was so incredible. He's the funniest person alive and so kind. And him and Gina felt like, parental on set um there was a very weird thing I did as a kid um he was talking about the different blood and how they're flavored there's like chocolate flavor and peppermint and um the it's basically corn syrup all the fake blood mm-hmm. and I um I kind of like touched his cheek and ate it off his face and he's like you know and then I realized like oh I shouldn't do that but it was like I wanted to, he was like, I think it's peppermint today, but we were always talking about the different flavors of blood. And I think I was just envious uh, that they got to have the fake blood, not knowing it's like horribly sticky and not fun to have on your face. But I was like, I really wanted at that time an injury. I was like, oh, maybe if I had a nosebleed, that'd be so cute. But it's like, no, that was for the adults in the film. But um, we would all sing. We were very much into Pink Floyd's The Wall. And so we would all sing that in between takes and they were teaching me the lyrics. And as a kid, that song is like really, really fun because you're just starting to begin to be a little anarchic. And you're like, what? I could just go against everything I'm being taught. That's fantastic. Mm-hmm. I will sign me up. So that's what we were doing in between takes. Well, you have that whole sequence near the end of the film where you're in the truck with Gina Davis and Samuel L. Jackson. And it's a pretty technical sequence to have to shoot. Um, did that take a fair amount of time to do? And was it quite, um, you know, grueling from just a time period? I, like, was there a lot of time spent in that truck? So, yeah, I I would get in the truck and then they'd cut, you know, and not and then there'd be no one in the truck when they're filming those big sequences. And then later when we're in the car together, I think. Um, I remember being in a car and uh, filming for the green screen. So everything, you know, it looks grueling and intense, but it is fake. I'm stuck in a toolbox in a uh, huge uh, truck. And then all the tools in there are just made of rubber. And it's actually kind of cozy. And, you know, I'm quite small. So I'm like, maybe I'll just fall asleep in here. I think I was napping um, for some of it. So you have to realize this was a 60, 70, 80, like, back in the 90s 80 i don't know 60 million dollar budget so everything was as luxurious as you could possibly imagine so i was like kind of like this is awesome like just every day um yeah well yeah i suppose um if we're talking about other people in the film and you mentioned craig earlier he obviously plays timothy <laughs> who is a- allegedly your father we would ever really find out for certain uh, but how is it working with Craig Bierko? He is the funniest person alive. So he was always cracking jokes and asking me a lot of questions. And um, he just, he, cause I, so I remember some of it, but not all of it, but he just said I was a very inquisitive child and was nonstop. Like, what does this person do? What is this like kind of annoying? And he had a lot of patience for that, for someone who's like, tell me like, a hundred things right now go (laughs) you know so um and then we would play like little games or you know he was very much like again just as generous as someone could be the only other person that rivals this kind of kindness or um you know like the concept of a bodhisattva like someone who's enlightened and they're putting it off 
they're putting off going to the other side to bring more people to the light. Like that kind of energy is George Clooney. Cause I grew up on ER and um, there was a really big disparity of uh, food distribution from principal cast to extras. And so he would crack open the cabinets that were locked up of food and just like with a crowbar, take um, take to the cabinet, open it up and toss food to the extras like, hey, you guys want some chips? And because he is very about like taking care of everyone on set. So there's equity and everyone feels warm. Like if there's if people don't have blankets or jackets, he's going to be making sure that's that's taken care of. And that was another person where I was like, oh, my God, like just all these examples of how to be and how to how to ensure that this is the best experience for everyone mm. every single day on a set. Um, so it was him and, and all these people on Long Kiss, all of them. And, and I, I remember Shane Black the least, but that's only because when you're a writer on the set, it's best you're scarce. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, it's the writer. Get out of here. Like, go away. So I, I know he was there, but I don't remember him too well. Um, well, I had a question about one of the big iconic scenes in the movie, which is the Gina Davis cutting vegetables scene. And just really interested to see here your observations of actually shooting that scene because it's unbelievable as portrayed in the movie. Yeah. So there was a stunt hand double who was expert at chopping uh, in that insert, like f super fast where you're just like, holy shit, this is crazy. And then there was a rubber knife used to throw. And then uh, the insert is uh, a real knife being thrown. So uh, another stunt person, different one, threw the knife. But she actually threw it and she um, practiced. I mean, she had a ton of extensive training for this film. So she was actually great at throwing it herself. Um, but ultimately it's cut together. So it looks just like, like that's the, that's the turning point, the first turning point of the movie. It's like, this is not going to be a domestic noir thriller this is going to be like this this is going to be a crazy adventure we're going out of this um suburban shit uh so it was really it, filming it was just as uh exciting as watching it in the final cut that, that is definitely the scene where the sort of the veneer begins to crack the, the yeah. glossy uh suburbia tends to starts to fall away um yeah for you what was your favorite scene to shoot um I really, I actually really loved the ice skating uh, scene. And again, I was trying not to laugh in that scene because her face got really close and I always thought, oh, geez. Uh, like, it was just like, oh, I, I was such, so I was such an, I am such a, an introvert. And on this set, I couldn't like look people in the eye. Like I would always look at the ground. And I remember Rennie being like, talking to someone and being like, she won't look me in the eye when I give directions. So my mom kind of was like, hey, if you could look it in the eye. And I finally was like trying to do that. But to me, like being an, <laughs> like just being that close to someone and having, yeah, just, it's like, okay, I know this is a serious scene, don't laugh. And I remember, um, I know I'm all over the place right now, but back in the day, I got fired from an episode of Roseanne because I, and it was an episode Norm Macdonald helped write. Mm -hmm. And um, cause I couldn't say my line and not laugh. I thought that the joke was funny. I, I had to say like, screw you four eyes. I thought that was so funny that someone who's wearing glasses could be called four eyes. And I just could not. And even people would tell me like, Hey, yeah, just don't laugh at your joke. But I was five. So I was like, okay, I won't laugh. And then I thought it was funny that I was laughing, but they told me not to laugh. So, you know, there was just, <laughs> you live and learn. But what I loved um, shooting that because I thought Gina on the ice was so physically impressive. And she was really a good skater too. It's just a, kind of an amazing athlete, just all the stuff she was doing. In the film, you couldn't ice skate. Can you ice skate in, in real life? I'm pretty good. Actually, that was one of the, my favorite memories pre pandemic. I went ice skating with a friend of mine and I was like, I'm so happy I did that. Cause uh, when we were all in lockdown, Miley Cyrus went on her Instagram and she's like, you know how I deal with mental illness. Like you just like go back in your memories and live on the good ones. And like, you know, if you have some good memories, yeah, we'll get through this. And I was like, Oh yeah. And I thought, I thought often of ice skating. Um, I'm like, yeah, that's, it's really fun. I was going to comment, like you say, you know, you're a very much an introvert on set for the long kiss goodnight. And 
that scene at the end where you have to basically try to bring Gina Davis back to life. I thought like they obviously had a lot of confidence in your abilities because that is a moment that hinges entirely on your performance. And did you feel pressure going into that scene? Did you know how important it was or was it, you know, as a child actor, just like, I've just got to pull this off and here we go. Um, we only did that a couple of times. We didn't do that many. That's like one or two takes, I think. And, um, uh, I was just imagining my mom being dead, which, you know, it's like your food source and all that, all those hugs just gone forever. So it's very easy to jump in as a kid. Um, it's funny, a lot of child, like there's a lot of actors who were child actors who are quite good, like Christian Bale or, Mm -hmm. and I wonder if they ever like, went and did training or if they just kept in touch with this feeling of like okay this is this is the circumstance and we're doing it um because yeah or Leonardo DiCaprio or there's so many that are just still doing it um and I am too I am too but I really love writing um and uh I love writing for tv especially I just worked on um a pirate show for HBO Max starring Taika Waititi uh as Blackbeard And it's going to be, I think, like a Barry Lyndon-esque crazy action comedy. Like, you know, it will redeem um, Cutthroat Island, I think. (laughs) You know, it will. Yeah. This is is the long game. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) Cutthroat Island has its fans. (laughs) It's a bit of a cult thing. But, (laughs) you know, how did the sort of the seg into writing really happen for you? And, you know, what were some of the early projects that got you excited about actually doing it, you know, full time? Uh, yeah, I, so it was the, that teacher who thought I was VIP and let me take over the school and put mm-hmm. up these plays. That was like the first audience testing. Um, and uh, then a couple years ago, I, this for, this theater company called Public Assembly in LA would put up my plays and the audience like um, was very interactive. It was like watching an audience of Maury, like yelling and hooting and hollering. And I was like, oh, well, like this is what TV is. The best TV you want to interact, you want to know the characters and you want to tell them, don't do that, don't go in there. Like you really want to be in the show with them. Um, so uh Last year during the pandemic, I changed careers. I wrote a spec of what we do in the shadows in a couple of days and got it to an EP on this pirate show and got in that room. And um, that was my first job as a staff writer. And I was like, oh, this is heavenly. And so I've just been writing a ton of stuff and um, and also acting still that my the staff writers uh, and my showrunner cast me in the show I wrote on. So I'm in it also. Um, as like an evil colonialist woman. (laughs) Um, But yeah, it's just, it's just a blast. And also reading great scripts like Shane scripts um, or these action movies I was in at good TV, it makes you want to be a good writer because you're like, this is what excellent writing is. And I, one can only aim, aim for that. Mm -hmm. Well, compared to the sort of challenges of acting, how are you finding writing? What's some of the challenges you're coming up against and how has being an actor sort of informed being a writer? I, I think they're really opposite circuits in the brain. Like actors, your job is to fully immerse yourself in life, like meet people, drink, stay up all night, like run around. And, and writing is really a marathon of suffering. Like it's about living a quiet monastic life and, and kind of saying no to the party. Like, no, thank you. I have to write. I have a deadline, like staying in and going inward. Um, and I, I just, I prefer that journey because it's endless that, you know, if you have an inner world, you can just play around in it. And I love building, building worlds and then getting lost in them. Um, but they really are just, I don't think they inform e- each other other than like, I will never write bad dialogue. Um, Cause I've, I've had to say it as an actor and, and you just, you're like, how did you, what is, who, people don't talk like this. Like it's so many actors. They're just like, I'm, and it's really great if someone's open to a little bit of a judging, but most people aren't. So you just have to make it sing. Um, yeah. So that's probably one thing where I'm like, not, not, I'm not, you know, I'm going to make something so someone will be excited mm. to read it and to be it. 
you know. Now, you know, The Long Kiss is written by Shane Black and you appeared in both Iron Man 3 and The Nice Guys, which he directed and wrote. And you've talked about how he's a friend of yours. Has there been any tips along the way or any guidance he's given as a writer to an aspiring writer? Yeah. Um, so when I was uh, 15, I ran into him at a party and I had remembered that he was very generous with people, with the young aspiring writers kind of mentoring them or giving them tips or whatever. So I went up to him. I was like, hey, I'm writing a novel. I was writing a novel at the time. Um, and he read it and encouraged me to finish it. And I think without his encouragement, I don't know if I would have finished it because it was a lot of it's a lot of work to write a book. And I, I didn't have any inroads into anywhere. Like I didn't know anyone in publishing or um, so he was like, look, this is like really edgy and you have a voice and, and just those words and that encouragement alone, um, you know, was, was like really uh, meaningful for me, especially at that age. So he's, I consider him a, a mentor right. in writing. Now, if we're looking at um, stuff you've worked on so far and things you're working on now currently, is there something you could point our listeners to that maybe isn't Iron Man 3, maybe it isn't The Nice Guys, maybe it isn't Long Kiss Goodnight, a piece of work that you've done you're particularly proud of that our listeners can go check out? Oh, yeah, I think um, so. There's an independent film called The Automatic Hate by a filmmaker named Justin Lerner, and I'm in it with my middle sister, Vanessa, and we play sisters. And so we don't have the the biggest role, but I really like the film. I think it's super well done. Um, And we are pretty wild in it and funny. So I really, I like uh, us together in that film. We're like the, the, there's the sisters and the fighter. No, I'm kidding. Um, We're just kind of feral. And um, that was also just a fun experience. But um, Justin Lerner is an amazing filmmaker and uh, all his stuff he has his own unique voice. So the automatic hate. Right. Okay. And I just had a quick question about Iron Man three. Now you play a pageant contestant in the scene where it's the, you know, beloved Stan Lee cameo. Now was Stan Lee actually there when they shot that or did you shoot it separately? Yeah, we shot, um, we shot a much larger sequence and I was there for like three days. Um, But I think the only reason that that whole sequence did not get cut is because it was his cameo. So I was like, oh, thank, thank, thank for, st- thankfully, Stan Lee was the reason I still get a residual on that one, one movie. Um, and that was one of his last cameos, I believe. Um, but man, what an incredible legacy that man has had. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, he really liked, um, he gives uh, the, the characters like, scores and he really liked playing that part you could tell he's like I get to give the girls oh you're a 10 like he was so cute um playing that character it was definitely one of the last ones he did where he actually went to the set I believe for sure yeah yeah um so before we wrap up uh um, maybe some more spy questions we have a couple of questions from twitter um so I'm sorry I'm sorry in advance I I I have read through these and checked them ahead of time so they're not (laughs) um the first one's from uh, D Chantry at G Chantry. He says, uh, how many times did Samuel Jackson swear on the set? He was not swearing in front of me. Ah, good man. I like but that. I might, I might have been. <laughs> good answer. Good answer. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's so funny out the two of you. He was the polite one. I love that. that, is, that yeah, is he was like, he was like, excuse me, don't touch my face. Boundaries, lady. <laughs> <laughs> you little kid. How does that blood taste? <laughs> hmm. um, uh, this one comes from at Kid Creole. And he asks, what was the most helpful piece of direction that Rennie Harlan gave you on set? Um, <laughs> this, is, this is just a, a funny answer. Um, he would often say, move, Gina, you're blocking Yvonne. <laughs> so he's just telling her to move out of the way because maybe she was in my light or something. Um, but no, he was always like bigger, more. And, uh, and I, I was like, uh-huh. Yeah, sure. Because <laughs> sometimes you, do, you take direction, you take it, and then you're like, I'm going to be subtle. I'm not being bigger. <laughs> I'm just privately going to be like, sure, yes, bigger. 
it's, it's the same as you saying you won't laugh at the uh, the four eyes joke, and then uh, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. like, I got you. I'm gonna mess this whole scene up and then get cut. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the last one comes from John uh, at Not Perfected Yet, and he asks. Uh, what was it like to have a husband and wife team as a director and on-screen mother, respectively? I think it was, you know, it was probably more fun than usual. We we had a lot of parties and a lot of dinners and a lot of hangs that you wouldn't have um, because they were married. Or were they married? Yeah, they were together. Um, and there was a real shorthand with them. So watching him direct her, it was like, yeah, you know, do that thing. It's like they couples have a their own language so it was uh, probably just more fun um well that was all of twitter you survived congratulations <laughs> I, I, yeah. I, got, I got rid of the worst of them um <laughs> now as we wrap up we we have a couple of quick fire spy questions for you so just to test your metal a wee bit here um first question what is your favorite spy film I don't know if it counts as a spy movie, but I do love On Her Majesty's Secret Service, the Bond movie with George Lazerby. And I like it because it's so, it's kind of really campy. It could, it, it's almost like on the Austin, Austin Power side of life. It's very funny, odd. It counts for sure. And actually it's another yeah. Christmas related film. So it's interesting you chose that one. <laughs> yeah. Of all the films we've found, we've got a list of about 600 films. There's only two Christmas films. That is one, and you are in the other one. So there's a lovely little connection there. Yeah, that's nice. Um, well, th this might lead the next question then, but who is your favourite James Bond? I, I have to say Sean Connery. Yeah. I just, it's mis he's Mr. Universe. Like, he, yeah, he's... Yeah. It's hard to argue against Sean Connery. Yeah. You really can't. <laughs> There's no I, other I'm answer. Sorry. Anyways. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, now that the we've wrapped up the most recent Bond era, Daniel Craig has moved on after five films and he did a terrific job. What would you like to see happen next with, with the James Bond franchise? I hope that someone amplifies this, but I would love to see Michaela Cole play Bond without any explanation. Uh, Michaela Cole made the show I May Destroy You and this other show ah. Chewing Gum and mm. she is the single most talented and unique voice of our generation and then also a cocky motherfucker like she <laughs> is Bond mm. I like that take I'm going to look that yeah. one I, yeah. I, I'm sure I've seen a bit of the, the first show you mentioned but I didn't know the name okay that's good different take we, yeah. we usually just get like someone will just say oh Henry Cavill it's like, okay, that's a good choice, I suppose, but it's not outside the box particularly. You know what I mean? I don't know. I, I don't know his work very well, but I feel like Bond, the, the way that that can keep staying relevant is to change. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we've been seeing the same. I think that Daniel Craig, those films are pretty incredible. They, they did an amazing job of keeping it modern. But um, yeah, if they, want, if they want me to go to the theater I'm only going to watch Michaela Cole as Bond. So I demand it. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, well, last question then. This is uh, not a usual question we ask, but because you are, you're in a spy Christmas movie, you, you, have the, you have the right to get this question. So what is your favorite Christmas movie? Oh, that's tricky. I, I, even though it, okay, so it doesn't hold up that well but every year I do watch a Christmas story with my mom and uh it still makes me laugh and I think it's just nostalgia and also mm -hmm. like the main character Ralphie is so good he's adorable and as I get older I appreciate Darren McGavin all the more as a kid didn't care about the dad now I'm like this guy's amazing he's hilarious oh he's incredible I mean yeah. the leg the leg lamp scene as I've gotten older is sick <laughs> it's really yeah. he's really he's really great i think he must have influenced brian cranston and malcolm in the middle like the dad is so um manic in a really delightful way so i don't know maybe i think solid solid choice now you mentioned the show you're working on on hbo at the moment is that official has it got a name release date and everything? yeah um that show is gonna be awesome it's called our flag means death and it's mm -hmm. sort of like if the office were at sea with a bunch of pirates. Um, and it's about this one man named Steve Bonnet who has a midlife crisis. And 
uh, he has a boat built and he hires a crew and goes out to sea to play pirate. And along the way, he meets the most famous pirate, Blackbeard. And this is a true story. They sail together and um, the rest is a bromance history gone wild. It's so it's a lot of fun and it's a two-hander with Taika Waititi and uh, Reese Darby from Flight of the Concords, who's mm -hmm. an incredible Kiwi actor. And we have a huge cast and they're all super talented. So I can't, I can't wait to watch. I don't know when it comes out, but sometime next year it will premiere. Nice. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, I've, Yvonne, I just want to thank you again for taking the time to talk to us about The Long Kiss Goodnight. It's one of our favorite spy films. Um, and just to talk to to talk to you about it, it's been an absolute thrill. Yeah. Oh, thank you. You you as well. There you go, folks. That was our chat with Yvonne Zimmer, aka Caitlin, from The Long Kiss Goodnight. And we don't often get a chance to speak with the actors in the films that we cover. We're usually speaking to screenwriters or directors. Um, and so it was actually really interesting to see the, the creation process for, as from an actor's point of view and a child actor at that as well. I mean, it's been close to 25 years since the film came out at this point. And, you know, Yvonne was six when she made it. So, you know, we, the fact that she recalled all this stuff is, is fantastic because, frankly, I do not remember anything about being six. Well, I was going to say I was almost nervous going into this interview because I had a lot of questions about The Long Kiss Goodnight. You watched the movie and I was like furiously jotting down notes because there's just so many scenes that she features into that are so memorable um and then also some of her other work movies like heat for example and executive decision where i'm like i could totally ask questions about these movies but like will she remember anything because i mean i'm in the same boat as you if you ask me about experiences from when i was six years old boy they'd be vague at best yeah vague at best is 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 generous if anything yeah. really i I, I just while you were talking, was just having a little think of, of things that happened when I was six. And I honestly haven't got any answers. If you ask me what happened yesterday, my answers are vague at best. <laughs> Who are you again? I don't know, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm the Samantha Kane of this podcast. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> um, well, life is pain. Mm. We have learned that at least. We have indeed. We have. But. Um, yeah, a fascinating story from Yvonne, just telling us about how getting the role in the first place. And I, I had no idea that people had to audition as, as child actors and let alone they would do coloring books. Yeah, uh, I was really interested just about the behind the scenes of auditioning for one of these movies when you are a child actor, because especially like Heat, because um, she talks about, you know, um, auditioning for Heat. And it's like, that is such an intense adult film how are you auditioning child actors like what is someone like michael mann doing when he's looking to hire kids for a movie like that and then you know obviously the long kiss goodnight again another very adult film very violent shane black script and just her um, portrait of you know basically auditioning and then going up and doing a scene with gina davis and that whole process was just fascinating yeah, I mean, just actually, they had to do the scene where Gina's uh, Samantha character almost dies, which is towards the end of the film. And that's a very harrowing scene. And, you know, a six-year-old has to find the emotional energy to, to channel that on cue. I, I Yeah, I, I, I was still playing with Power Ranger toys at this point, and I frankly would not have had the emotional intelligence to do that at all. And like Shane Black films have a history of really strong kid performances. He didn't obviously direct The Long Kiss Goodnight, but when you go through his work, um, written or directed or both, um, it does feature a lot of strong child actors. And you think of so many of the movies of this era, like this is the post Home Alone era, where it's a lot of movies of like cute Moppets doing things for the camera, you know, like that's the whole Richie Rich kind of period and just all these kind of movies trying to follow in the footsteps of like your home alones and it's like you look at her performance in this movie and it's like so grounded so believable and she's existing within a movie that's in so many ways a cartoon like it's really over the top and they give her that big dramatic moment at the end and it completely works emotionally and it's a lot to put on a young actor to really pull off a scene like that 
No, I mean, there's a scene where they're, um, where Caitlin and Samantha are locked in a freezer. Yeah. And she has to turn to Gene Davis and say, am, am I going to die now? And, I mean, that's a... Asking a kid to say that, I mean, maybe they don't fathom the depth of what that means, but that's still... Uh, that's a lot, man. It was really interesting to hear her whole perspective on you know, what she was like at that time and how comfortable she was on sets, obviously because of, you know, visiting sets with her sisters and then also just being the one who was swearing the most on set in comparison to Samuel Jackson. Like, just stories like that are were really fun to hear. Yeah, and uh, we've spoke about the, the physicality of Gina Davis's character, Samantha, or, or Charlie, whoever you prefer, and the, the physical training she had to do for it. But, you know, I was really curious about the Caitlin character being thrown out the side of the house. And it turns out that was all Yvonne. That scene enchanted you when we saw the movie the first time, because you hadn't seen it before we reviewed it for the show. And mm. I remember you bringing that scene up on the podcast in delight. <laughs> it, it was between that scene and the moose coming through the front of the, uh, of the windshield, which also got a mention for me in the interview too. They stick in my memory um, just as much as the moose stuck in the windshield. Well, you can see why this movie has become a real cult film that has its very passionate fan base. A fan base that deserves a 4K restoration of this movie. <laughs> yeah, it's it's one of those weird ones that we've encountered before, much like True Lies, for instance. That you just think, why is there no upscaled version of this? Who knows, right? Like, it's so strange. I don't know how these decisions are made because you look at a lot of these boutique labels like Shout Factory or Scream Factory or, you know, Vindicator, all these things. And it's like, why has this movie not been picked up for one of these remasters? Like, who knows, right? Like, I'm sure it's going to sell X amount of copies if they just do it. So come on, people. Do we need to start that campaign? I don't know. Well, our, our True Lies campaign did really well. That's true. That's true. Mm. Well, it, to be fair, it's it's the festive season. Now should be the time that they're launching it, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this and this film, and Yvonne said it, and we both agreed. It, not only does it still hold up. But it is just actually a really good film that just flew under the radar for a lot of people. I'm not sure I have the, the it's not exactly FOMO, but fear of knocking out FONO. Do we get FONO? Sure. Do, do you want me to explain what that means to you, Cam? The fear of knocking out? As in not making a knock list. Oh, I see. Well, yeah, that's what I referred to at the start of the uh, yeah, you know, yeah. this episode, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure I have the uh, the phono, which I don't think is as catchy as uh, Festbionage, but clearly not if you have to explain it to the person who helped create the knock list. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Cam. Thank you, Cam. Um, <laughs> um yeah, I, I don't think I regret not putting it on, but it, it it's one of those entries that is solid but just didn't quite make it. And I, I'm so I'm happy with it being in that position. No, it belongs, I think, probably next to like a Men in Black, like a movie that is really rewatchable and that you can go back to again and again. But does it kind of make the knock list of the all time spy films? Maybe not. But that doesn't mean that like, you know, by the time I reach the end of my journey, I won't have seen The Long Kiss Goodnight more times than The Ipcris File, for example. Can you imagine if that's what you come out of Spy Hards is like seeing The Long Kiss Goodnight about 20 times and Ipcris File not quite and... Do you question your film reviewing skills at that point? You know? No. I've watched um, Jaws 3D too many times to uh, <laughs> really start to um, contemplate the um, the outcomes of these decisions. Your, your credibility is already shot, is what you're saying. Long gone. So long gone. Hey, you spend hours every week talking to me. Of course it's gone. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And she was, of course, very complimentary of of Gina Davis and just the sort of rapport they built on set and also the rapport with the director, Rennie Harlan, who was of course um, with Gina Davis and I'm not sure if they were married at this point, but uh, she was nothing but complimentary of the whole process. And I think the positive energy that was obviously on that set comes through in the film. Well, there's so many movies that are along the lines of a long kiss. Good night. These big expensive blockbusters with a lot of stars attached and you hear about the productions and they don't sound fun. Mm -hmm. Like it just sounds like a lot of work and often a lot of tension. And this was a case where, yeah, you have Gina Davis and Rennie Harlan. And I think just kind of the vibe of them being a family 
kind of extends on to the rest of the set where it just felt like a lot more of a friendly atmosphere and especially one for a you know six-year-old actor to be um, working within that was probably a lot um, more pleasant than it could have been like this really could have been you know a very fraught tense shoot which so many movies like this are especially with its adult themes yeah. as well like it, it could have been quite intense for the for, for Yvonne and so I, I was glad that she had such a positive experience and it shows because she wanted to come talk to us about the film she took time out of her day and she's you know she's a busy writer nowadays to come and speak to us and you know we're thrilled but also like just hearing stories about taking uh, fake blood off of Samuel Jackson's face and try not to blink in front of Craig Bierko. This is the kind of stuff. This is why I like talking to people about the film. This is why I do it. Well, everything about Craig Bierko, I was just riveted by because just rewatching the movie again, he's insane in this movie. Like why this guy is not a huge star after that performance, because he is electric in this movie. We'll have to talk to him and find out. Mm, yeah, we'll mm. see. Challenge accepted. But yeah, we did our usual round of spy questions as well. And she pointed out on Her Majesty's Secret Service as her favorite spy film. Uh, Serendipitous, really, that it's the only other Christmas spy film. Yeah, and that's the first mention we've got so far of Honor Majesty's doing one of these interviews. We've gotten a lot of people reference early Conneries, but no one has ever said Honor Majesty's. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, we've had like Casino Royale and things like that. So it, it, to go down the Lazenby route, but she did also choose Sean Connery as her Bond, which is yeah. not a bad shout in any stretch, to be honest. No, with you. that's that's the like the popular choice, right? And and popular for a reason. But again, we want to thank Yvonne for taking the time to speak with us. Yeah, you know, we had a blast talking about the Long Kiss Goodnight. We had a blast watching it, and we hope you did too. But what have we got coming up next week? Well, Scott, we are wrapping up the year 2021. We did this last year as well, where we take a look back at the films we covered on Spy Hearts Podcast and look at the best, the worst, and, you know, the rest, and what really 2021 meant for this year of podcasting. Yeah, we had a lot of fun with it last year, and we thought we'd expand it a little bit. We've got some of your feedback as well, some of your thoughts on the year that it has been. Another dumpster fire of a year, unfortunately, but one whole year of Spy Hard's podcast. So a lot to look back on. But 2022 is going to be great, right? Sure. <laughs> I, I hope. <laughs> I'm so tired. <laughs> But yeah, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to go back and listen to every episode you haven't listened to already and listen to the rest of them again and join us for our wrap-up episode as we catalogue our favourite and maybe disliked films of 2021. You can, of course, follow us discreetly on social media at SpyHards, that's S-P-Y-H-A-R-D-S on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. But until next week, listeners, that's right, you can't kill me, motherfuckers. Motherfuckers.